Yep, great. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Rick Hansen to the Storybox. Now, for those of you that don't know who he is and his incredible work, you're in for a real treat. And I'm very much looking forward to the topics of conversation that we're going to be discussing today because they're quite well versed, such as resilience, happiness, the Buddha's brain. That's an interesting one. And so many others. Uh, But Dr. Hansen is a psychologist, senior fellow at Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. I'm sure many of you might know that uh, Dr. Matt Walker actually is at UC Berkeley too. There's a fun fact for you guys. He's also a New York Times bestselling author. His books have been published in 30 languages and include Neurodharma, uh, Resilient, Hardwiring Happiness, Buddha's Brain, Just One Thing, and Mother Nature. He's got over 900,000 copies in English to date. I believe that number has probably uh, since increased since his bio was released. Uh, and his weekly newsletter, when this bio was released, 220,000 people, probably more than that now. He's uh, an expert in, this is interesting to me, uh, positive neuroplasticity, which we'll no doubt talk about. He's also been featured in a lot of amazing amazing articles and news outlets. But Dr. Hansen, can I welcome you so much to the Storybox podcast today? Oh, thank you. Please call me Rick. Hopefully I can then call you Jay. And I'm really glad to be here. I um, am obviously an American. I visited, I have visited Australia many times. If I were uh, about 25, knowing what I know now, I would seriously consider emigrating and your country would be high on the list of candidates. Anyway, so I'm very glad to be here. Well, it's funny you should say that because I'm 25 at the moment. So, you know, I mean, yeah. we're in good graces now. Yeah, good <laughs> um, stuff. But- uh, yeah, I'm glad that I get to call you Rick because, you know, I was taught and brought up with the philosophy of actually being respectful to my my elders and, and people <laughs> that actually have degrees and I like calling them doctor and, and things like that. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, I'm very excited to dive further into your backstory, why you decided to do this uh, research and work in the first place. But before we dive further in, my very first question for you, my friend, is what does success look like for you? Hmm. Well, I think the ultimate metric of success is fulfillment in service with a related factor of quality of life. In other words, if a person is fulfilled by their work and it has contributed to others and yet it's made them miserable along the way, that would not be success. So for me, true success is the trifecta of fulfillment, contribution, and happiness broadly along the way. I want to get into happiness and in just a moment as well, but the idea of real fulfillment or this understanding of fulfillment, a lot of people are, I guess, wanting it or trying to chase it without actually achieving it. Firstly, what is real fulfillment? Why is fulfillment important? And second, and thirdly, sorry, how do we achieve fulfillment? Oh, just a simple question. Way just to go, man. Simple one. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Technically, I in psychology, we think of two kinds of well-being or two aspects of well-being, eudaimonic and hedonic. So eudaimonia is a kind of new word, which has to do with, we could say, fulfillment, meaning and purpose. Hedonic well-being is the pleasure we get right now, let's say, in a fun conversation with somebody or having a meal with friends or cheering on your sports team or being totally excited that your kid got a little prize at school, uh, you know, enjoying life. Both of them go together, and there's been a tendency to overvalue eudaimonic fulfillment and downplay hedonic fulfillment to avoid the criticism that this is just navel-gazing and being selfish. But actually, they go together. Uh, That said, for many people, there's um, a kind of deep, soulful satisfaction that comes from doing certain kinds of things that in the moment are not very pleasurable like getting up at three in the morning to walk your kid up and down the hallway is not particularly hedonically satisfying, 
but it's deeply fulfilling. So both of them go together. So how do we have fulfillment in that eudaimonic sense? First is to do things that for you touch really important values, often about serving others. On the other hand, there is something very fulfilling in actualizing or using your capacities. Imagine a thoroughbred horse born to run, yet tied to a plow, having to go up and down the same furrows in the cornfield over and over and over again. The horse can do that, but there's something unfulfilled in his capabilities. And I think it's helpful for people to ask themselves, hey, is there something in me, some talent, some capacity, some energy that's yearning to be expressed? So I think alongside the element of service, there is this element of self-actualization that's important in fulfillment. Then last to finish, and maybe this will take us into positive neuroplasticity. If you wanna feel fulfilled in your work, it's important to internalize experiences of fulfillment. That may seem so obvious, and yet for many people, they're continually chasing the prize. They're chasing the carrot in front of the proverbial donkey that's always just out of reach. And it's very important along the way to allow experiences of both eudaimonic well-being and hedonic well-being to, to, to land inside, to sink in. So gradually, literally, you start to transform those states of fulfillment that would otherwise pass through your brain, like water through a sieve, you can gradually transform those states of fulfillment into trait fulfillment, which is hardwired physically, literally, into your nervous system, so that you take that sense with you wherever you go, of uh, feeling already fulfilled, which tends to undermine, in really good ways, the tendency to crave more, 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 my precious, right? Which keeps us on this wheel of craving and suffering, you know, that the Buddha pointed to, for example, 2,500 years ago. This question might actually lead into positive neuroplasticity, which I am very curious about. But the idea of what goes on, I guess, in the mind when we do have these fulfilling things? Do we need to have more than one thing going on in our life that is quite fulfilling or is it one thing just enough to satisfy the brain and give us that sense of meaning and purpose? Many people have multiple things that are fulfilling. And uh, they're raising a child, let's say, while planting trees and um, doing their work. So it's, it's okay to have multiple things. That's, that's not an issue. The issue that I see is that many people, including people like you, frankly, Jay, accomplishing high-performance people, often with a good heart, really trying to help the world, clearly also like you, uh, truly, um, they're racing through life without receiving into themselves the fruits of what they've earned along the way. And there's a famous saying in neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. They do that automatically for negative experiences, but they don't tend to wire together automatically for enjoyable, wholesome, meaningful, fulfilling experiences. The brain has what's called a negativity bias, which makes it like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. So the opportunity is a handful of times every day, a breath or two at a time, doesn't take very long to do this, slow down to take in the good. Slow down to let it land what it feels like to be of help to others. You know, what does it feel like to have an open heart? What does it feel like to have grit and gumption and perseverance, even when you're tired, because it's your job and you got to do it? What does it feel like to let that sink in? What's it feel like when other people are appreciative or acknowledging of you? Can you slow it down? It, it's not going to make you a tall poppy. Actually, the people who seek to become tall poppies usually do so because deep down inside, they feel that there's a deficit of self-worth. So they're continually trying to impress other people. But as we repeatedly internalize experiences, including of self-worth, then we move through life feeling already full. Why is service so fulfilling? 
Well, I think it goes to our deeply social nature. I mean, if you think about it, uh, the way we live and have lived for the last 10,000 years is really bizarre. It's totally at odds, including the last 20 years or 100 years with our uh, biological template. Um, human species, people anatomically modern humans have walked this earth for 300,000 years. And their way of life was almost always until just 10,000 years ago in small hunter-gatherer bands of roughly 40 to 50 people that cooperated intensively with each other. Now, bands were fairly aggressive on average with other bands, but those encounters were, you know, fairly brief and minimal and ended one way or another fairly quickly. But most of their life was internal. And that internal interaction with 40 to 50 other people, you're knowing your whole life, you're raising your children together, you're looking for food together, you're dealing with dangers and adversaries together. There is, there is such a strong emphasis in human evolution, even distinct from other primates that we're related to among the great apes like gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos, um, there is such a premium in human evolution toward caring and sharing, which is actually a model of relatedness that's talked about academically. So we evolved to be compassionate. We evolved to be altruistic. We evolved to be helpful to others. And there's a lot of sense of reward related to it. Now, we have to be careful that we don't get involved in what's called pathological altruism, too much giving. We don't want to be exploited by others. We want to be careful about that, especially if for a person, like to generalize girls and women who are typically socialized to become invested in caring for others while putting their own needs on a back burner sometimes. Obviously, I'm generalizing many exceptions. Males can be socialized in that way as well. But if generally, generally, you know, if you've been pushed into putting your own needs on a shelf and not being on your own side, you know, be a particularly careful about the pleasures of serving others. But service is natural. I think there's a lot of people out there that are realizing more and more today that service is I guess, more fulfilling. And mm-hmm. I've realized that and I want to do it. But then I guess what you were saying is you got to be, it's like that fine line of being careful not to be exploited. But yeah. then when you do get exploited, it kind of goes back to that negativity bias that you you were alluding to before that is, I guess, hardwired within us. We just bring up all these negative emotions and scenarios as a result of being exploited. Like, What's the point of serving anymore if we've been exploited and we've been hard done by that sort yeah. of thing? So firstly, why is the negativity bias so prevalent in our society mm-hmm. and can we ever get rid of it? Yeah, the negativity bias is one of the strongest findings in neuroscience, really. Mm-hmm. And there are some kind of minor exceptions to it. Like for example, some kind of survey in the United States said that 89% of all teenagers were convinced that they would become either a rock star or a professional athlete. Okay, I'm like, yeah, go for your dreams. And you know, maybe have a plan B just in case, right? So that's, that's an optimism bias, for example. And we also tend to edit pain out of personal memories uh, for various reasons. I'm a longtime rock climber. And I, what I remember most about rock climbing is feel, being with my friends and the beauty of the situation and just the athletic achievement of it. I forget the fact that my feet were killing me in those stupid tight shoes jammed into a crack for example, those are the exceptions. But in general, if you think about our ancestors in the wild and early humans even, um, you know, you need carrots and you got to avoid sticks. Well, if you don't get a carrot today, you'll have a chance at one tomorrow. But if you fail to avoid that stick today, that predator, that natural hazard, or that aggression inside your band or between bands, whack, no more carrots forever. So we have a brain that's designed to scan for bad news, over-focus on it, overreact to it, over-remember it, and become gradually sensitized to stress and sorrow and pain along the way. There's no comparable mechanism for beneficial, normal, enjoyable, fulfilling experiences. So for me, here's the takeaway. Deal with the bad for sure. And also, when you can, 
when there is that moment, you've you've put out the fire, you've dealt yeah. with that other person, you've you've allowed the the hurt, the sorrow, the anger to wash through you, turn to the good. Not to avoid the bad, but actually to equip yourself to deal even better with the bad in the future. So deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. When you have that opportunity to register your own strengths, your own capabilities, the good news of life, the goodness innate in your own heart, slow it down to learn from that experience. Turn that state into a trait. That's the neuroplastic change part, positive neuroplastic change, rather than just having that experience wash through you and waste it on your brain. Is neuroplasticity, if I'm getting this correct, is that the ability for our brains to change rather than our minds or is it both? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, uh, deep question there. You know, Descartes took a swing at that. Him also mind, you know, brain, mind, body distinction, and so forth. So, plasticity just means the capacity of something to change. Typically, a physical system. Neuroplasticity is the ways in which the nervous system is designed to learn. The least of which is book learning. The important learning mainly is somatic sensory, emotional, attitudinal, interpersonal, intrapersonal as well, even spiritual learning. That's what's really important. Okay, for any kind of lasting learning to occur, for a child to learn to walk instead of crawl, or an adult to learn how to navigate a tricky conversation with the in-laws or you know the guy next door at work, uh, something has to change physically in our nervous system for there to be that kind of learning, including the acquisition of the strengths that we care about, such as mindfulness, compassion, grit, gratitude, interpersonal skills, and positive moods. Emotionally, a positive moods are major inner strengths that help us be more resilient, they buffer us against stress, and they aid our physical health and our longevity positive emotion. So happiness is really skillful means. So the question then becomes, how do you grow the good stuff inside? And the dirty little secret in mental health broadly in 100 years is that most of the experiences that people have that are beneficial in the moment or that therapists, coaches, counselors, teachers, and so forth are helping people to have, have no lasting value. Those experiences are momentarily pleasant, but they wash through the brain. There's no learning from them. People don't actually develop trait mindfulness or trait grit or trait resilience or trait self-worth or trait happiness. And it's that movement from state to trait, the acquisition of traits that I think of as growth 2.0. The old model was that growth 1.0 People were basically passive vessels into which therapists or teachers or podcasters or writers or parents would pour experiences and information. And yeah, sometimes it sticks for some people, but for a lot of people, a lot of the time doesn't stick at all. It just washes right through. Growth 2.0, which is my own personal focus with positive neuroplasticity, treats people as active agents in their own healing and growing and awakening so that while they're having various experiences or doing various things, including listening to your podcast or my own, they're actually actively engaging those experiences in ways that promote lasting neuroplastic change so that they're gradually hardwiring the benefits of their experiences into themselves to be taken with them wherever they go. There's a lot there. Yep. <laughs> um, maybe people can go back and re-listen to that, what you just said. I'm trying to process everything that you were just saying. Uh, for the increase of, I guess, mental health in our yeah. in our world today, why is that the case? Like compared to our, our ancestors, right, that might not have had the same, I guess, problems in, or were they even aware the mental health issues existed as opposed to today. I mean, the the increases are, are enormous. Like there's more people being depressed. There's more people with anxiety. There's more people that are, I guess, in tune with the fact that they're being through traumas as well. Like why is that? And is do you foresee it going to get worse? Like do you think that change 
in the future is going to be positive or negative in your opinion? It's a really complicated question and it's hard to measure, of course, uh, subjective well-being, basic well-being, or the incidence actually of um, distress and dysfunction. Those are the terms that shrinks like me use. Um, you know, how do you compare today with people 100 years ago? A lot of people 100 years ago felt what they felt, but there was a taboo about talking about it. It's also true that uh, 100 years ago, let's say, um, people typically had more social support than a typical person does today, certainly in Western affluent countries. It's also true that much of human misery is based on their circumstances. And while the world is far from a perfect place and there are many troubling developments, especially related to catastrophic climate change, uh, nonetheless, worldwide, extremes of poverty have been reduced. There's still a long way to go. But there's a fair amount of human misery that you could just find in reading a novel from Dickens 150 years ago, roughly in London, uh, or reading about, you know, uh, the European colonization of the Australian subcontinent or whole continent. Man, a lot of pain and sorrow and crap that led to a lot of misery. So I'm not sure with the premise necessarily. All that said, the money question is the one you're zeroed in on. What can we do about it? And for me, for me, there are these four questions that I keep circling back to in my own personal life and also as a professional. Where does it hurt? What would help? How can we grow it? How can we use it? Both out in the world, reducing injustice, reducing poverty, stopping people from invading peaceful countries next door to them. You know, there's a place to intervene out in the world. Put a stop sign next to your kid's school. Great. Get the neighbors to quit being jerks and dumping their garbage on your front lawn. Do what you can out in the world. Okay. But mainly where we have opportunity to grow the good that will help is inside our own being inside our own psyche, our own psychology, inside our own minds. And so that's where I tend to focus. Where does it hurt? What would help if it were more present inside you as a strength or a resource? And then how can we grow it? And then how can we use it once we grow it? Those questions are very useful for people to zero in on. And for me, it goes to the hopeful possibility that we really can grow resources. We can grow strengths inside ourselves, including based on neurological evidence for changing the brain in lasting ways that are evident with an MRI, for example, scanning people who've gone through various growth experiences. And to me, it's beautiful to know that you and I and everyone has a kind of sacred power, an inalienable sacred power to grow the good inside ourselves, even if we need to keep quiet because we're in a dangerous or, you know, over, over, we're, out overpowered kind of situation. Deep down in our innermost being, we know what we know, we see what we see, and we can help ourselves learn a little and heal a little and internalize the good a little bit every day, gradually growing it inside ourselves. To me, that's incredibly hopeful. It's incredibly hopeful for me, especially being able to, to hear you say it. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you about the brain and the mind and right. giving people some healing strategies for that. I think identifying that is there is the first yeah. thing, accepting that it's there and then also accepting that we can change it as it, like it doesn't need to stay there. So how or what are some strategies that you can recommend to people yeah. that might be struggling with all kinds of mental health issues to build a more resilient brain and mind? Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, one is to relate to stressors, relate to challenges, and relate to painful experiences in, as best you can, a more spacious and self-compassionate kind of way in which you're neither fighting the 
sadness or hurt or stress or anger, because if you resist it, what, re what we resist persists a lot. You're not doing that, but on the other hand, you're not being invaded by it. You're being mindful of it. That's a major thing that we can do. And mindfulness, that kind of spaciousness of awareness in which we witness it, we're, we're, we're feeling those feelings, we're having that experience, but we're observing it with a little bit of space around it. That acts like a kind of circuit breaker that slows down or even stops that negative material from getting internalized into us. So I think of one major move is to be with your experience in this mindful, spacious, self-compassionate kind of way. Very, very important. People can do that and they can train in that capacity. A little bit of meditation here, a little bit of everyday mindfulness there, gradually developing more of that witnessing and that sense of being in effect identified with a kind of core of being inside yourself that feels intact and inherently at peace, even while you're observing a lot of turbulence, a lot of crazy crud moving through your awareness, being one. Two, as soon as, you can, as soon as it feels appropriate, move into letting go. Not ruminating about things, not rehashing them over and over and over again, not dwelling on your resentments. There's a saying, resentment is like taking poison and waking others, wait, waiting for others to die. You know, let go where you release tension from your body. Maybe you vent some feelings in appropriate ways. Yell in the shower. Don't yell at your kids. You know, don't kick the dog. But you just release. Uh, realizing that certain desires, they're just not going to help you. You can abandon them. You can, you know, have one beer, maybe two. And you don't need to keep on going. There's a proverb, I think, from China. You know, man takes drink, drink takes drink, drink takes man. All right? You want to kind of be careful about that slippery slope. Okay, that's the letting go. A lot of letting go. And then very important, easily forgotten, let in. Let be, let go. Don't forget to let in. Don't forget to turn to the good and take in the good. Look for ways to grow from the experience you're having. Ask yourself, what would help me if I were a little more skillful about this? Or if there were a way of being a little more developed inside me, a little more patience, a little more self-respect, a little more skillfulness, a little more impulse control, <laughs> whatever it might be, a little more self-compassion, a little more empathy for others. What would help me to grow? That's incredibly useful. So to kind of summarize, if your mind is like a garden, you can witness it, let it be, you can let go, you can pull weeds, and you can let in, you can plant flowers. And that gives people a kind of an overall framework, including the very important one of planting flowers. And what I would say about that neurologically is that most of the time, the things we want to grow inside ourselves, we need to dwell in them for at least a few seconds in a row for them to have a chance of getting registered as a lasting change of neural structure or function. So that means not clinging to what's positive or pleasurable or hopeful. It's kind of like receiving it into yourself, marinating in it. And fundamentally, if you think about it, where your mind repeatedly dwells is what comes to dwell inside you. So this means feeling the negative, but not overdwelling there, not obsessing about it, not ruminating about it, not rehashing it, disengaging your attention at some appropriate point. If there's no more value there, there's nothing more to learn and shifting it elsewhere. So you start to dwell in a sense of capability and competence and positive intentions, you, you recognize your own sincerity, even if you're a work in progress like I am, right? That's where you dwell. You, you enjoy health, healthy contact with other people. You enjoy looking out the window and seeing the sunrise. I think it's, it's the morning there for you, right? In Australia, it's the mid afternoon for me. Um, you know, that's where you dwell. And as you repeatedly dwell there and you give yourself permission to dwell there, that's the good that increasingly dwells in you, literally based on lasting changes in your own brain.
like how you mentioned being able to let go, but then also yeah. let in. But yeah. I guess when you're letting in, uh, you, you're being mindful of the things that you are letting back in. But yeah. that letting in also requires something that not many people want to do, which is vulnerability. I mean, letting in someone else to supposedly help you go through these difficult challenges uh, in your life. Yeah. I mean, that takes a lot of effort. And it, because if you do let someone in, you don't know whether or not they're going to hurt you even more. So therefore, if you do open up, it's kind of like you're putting yourself at risk a little bit. And I guess not a lot of people want to do that. So, but I like how you're talking about letting in, not necessarily people, but letting in things that are going to serve you in a good way. Things like, I guess, nature and those so those sort of things. That's what I find, well, yeah, helpful. That's very interesting, Jay. So if you're willing, I'm going to maybe ask you a question or two about that. Yeah. Kind of turn the tables here a little bit. So, okay, good. I see that big grin. That's good. Thanks. For, <laughs> glad you're up for it. So you're describing a kind of letting in, really important, letting in other people. That's different from the kind I was talking about, which is about essentially growing strengths inside. Yeah. And we grow strengths inside in a, in a two-step process that's very simple, but you need the second step, which is we grow strengths, pick something you might want to grow inside, would, and I'll get to what if it were more present inside you or somebody else would help them be more comfortable with emotional vulnerability to other people and a comfort with the feeling of closeness with other people, including just buddies, let's say. It doesn't have to be lovers or life partners, right? What would help a person, you know, be more comfortable? add that kind of openness and vulnerability if it were more present inside their minds. That's the kind of strength I'm talking about. So to ask you here, if you imagine yourself, any kind of discomfort you might have, maybe based on your history with being open or receptive, let's say to other people, what if it were more present in your mind at the time would help you let people in? For me, a big one would be hearing their story, like what they yeah, went. What, yeah, no. no. What if it were more present in your mind would help you be more able to manage the embarrassment or the sense of vulnerability that is blocking you from really receiving another person? Is it okay not to know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's where you started. You talked about, in effect, a very common, very common kind of anxiety about, quote unquote, letting people in. Very understandable. You know, I grew up with loving, decent parents, but my mom, in a lot of ways, used her lovingness a little like a Trojan horse. She would get me to open the gates, let her in, and then she would criticize and control me. Yeah. Out of good intent on her part, but still in ways that... I didn't like and weren't very skillful in our relationship. Okay. So um, something that helps people be more comfortable with closeness and being kind of revealed, let's say, is, uh, a, is a sense of self-worth, that what they're revealing is okay. And yeah, maybe I've got some warts, but altogether, I'm a worthy being. So that, if it were more present in the mind of a person, would typically help them be more open to take to letting other people in. Another is the capacity to kind of calm yourself when you're starting to get a little keyed up, like, oh, we're getting a little close here. Ah, you know, that normal reaction. Does a person have the trait of self-soothing and self-calming? So being able to calm and soothe ourselves when we're starting to get a little anxious or a little ah, flustered, that would help a person be more open with other people. So those are just two things right there, self-worth and self-calming that are inner strengths, inner resources 
well understood in psychology. I'm sure a bunch of people have written papers about them. As we grow these strengths inside, then, for example, we become more capable of and comfortable with letting other people in. I'm glad that you mentioned both. And thank you for that. <laughs> that was very helpful. And although I couldn't really answer the question, I'm glad that you expanded for me. Um, yeah, because I don't know everything. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> and, in a way, I'm, I, I, I picked on you a little bit, but I got to tell you, Jay, I, I've taught this material, including in Australia, to workshops, you know, with 100, 200 therapists in the room. And when I turned this question to the person, what if it were more present in your mind would really help? Mm. Deafening silence. Because we don't tend to think this way. Now, if I were to ask you, you know, I look at your office here, it's nice. You know, what would make your office even better? You would say, oh, I want to put something, movie posters on the wall, like you used to have, let's say, or something or other. It, in practical terms, we easily think that way. But if we think about our minds, what would equip your mind better? Ooh, uh, what? It's hard to answer it. And a lot of our answers, like no offense, is factually your answers, are not about the question. They're not about equipping the mind better, our own mind. They're about what would be good if other people did? Or what would be a good action to take? Like listening to the, the true story, the deep story of another person, all of which is great, but it doesn't address the question. What are the strengths you're trying to grow inside? And so you're not alone. That's a, that's a weirdly difficult question for people to wrap their minds around. Um, and yet it's such a fundamental one and it's so practical you just kind of think about it. It's so down to earth. What if it were more present inside your psychology, your way of being, your capabilities would really help you with the challenges you're facing these days? I think education on this particular subject is need, needed in order to help someone. And I'm glad that you're doing this work and I'm glad that I didn't know so that I can learn and yeah. I'm glad that I'm not alone in this as well because I'm pretty sure that a lot of people that are listening to it wouldn't have known either. And yeah. they're like, oh, light bulb. It makes sense now. Like it yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Like we go through life, right? It's uh, I've done a lot of stuff in wilderness. Like I've said, you know, we're on this long hike. Okay. What's in your backpack? Well, your mind is your backpack. What's in there? And you just think, oh, I get it. On a long hike, I need supplies of various kinds, water, power bar, cell phone. You know, I want to, the stuff I want to take with me that helps me. First aid kit, a little extra jacket just in case. Well, inside your mind, what do you want to equip it with? And then the question becomes, how can you grow that equipment there? By experiencing it and then internalizing that experience again and again and again to hardwire that equipment into your nervous system. How do we, or why is resilience so needed in today's society? And how do we help people understand how to build resilience more and more? Yeah. Well, so my dad grew up on a ranch in North, in. America. He was a cowboy and uh, he lived through the depression and difficulty. My mom was raised by a single mother, didn't have much money. You know, people people have challenges. We've, we've needed resilience forever. Resilience is the inner capability to cope with challenge and to recover from great difficulty. We need resilience on the worst day of our life, but we also need resilience every day of our life to keep moving through right? Uh, difficulty, including serious difficulty. So we definitely need it. How do we grow it? You named it. We grow it by building strengths inside. Just like we said, we become more resilient by developing patience, grit, determination, perseverance. And there was a big light bulb moment for me when I was young, when I realized that as much as my life sucked and I was super unhappy and a total neurotic, like <laughs> nut job of a teenager, uh, you know, no matter how bad it was, I could always heal a little, grow a little, learn a little every day. And um, that is just fantastic that we can do that. So that's how to become more resilient, you know. You know? And um, sometimes there, there's, there are certain core skills. I would say being able, if I were to name, you know, kind of like 
If you're gonna, you ever see the TV show um, Alone? It's really wild. I think you'd like it. Basically, I think seven seasons. They take people who are wilderness survival experts and they drop them in a remote place, like an Arctic setting, and they're entirely alone. They have to film themselves. There's no crew nearby. And if they get into trouble, it could be 12 or 24 hours before they can get a medical team to them. They are on their own. And they're allowed to take 10 items from a list, right? What's on that list, right? So you can imagine all of that. It's really a fascinating show, including speaking to how vulnerable we are to isolation and how truly inherently dependent we are on relationships with other people and because they are really alone. Um, well, major items for resilience. Being able to calm your body, very, very important. Being able to regulate impulses uh, so that you don't get in trouble by doing certain stupid things that hurt others and hurt yourself, very important. Another definitely is mindfulness and self-awareness. Can you observe your own mind? Can you step back and watch the movie going by without necessarily believing all the thoughts there? Really important. Do you have a warm heart? Warm heartedness is a major factor of resilience. It's probably number one, including based on research, the sense of your own personal warm heartedness and that you have a feeling of positive connections with other people. Major factor of resilience. And then specific skills for what you have to deal with. If something happens and you don't know what to do, you know, your, your building starts to burn, you're in a house that starts to burn. If you don't have the skill of being able to climb out a window or, you know, unlock a front door, you're in trouble, right? So functional resilience does involve certain skills for certain situations. Maybe I'll just leave it there in terms of some major factors. I'm sure people listening will say, why didn't you say self-compassion? Why didn't you say gratitude? Okay, I just said them. <laughs> but it's kind of a short list. And the good news is that we can grow these strengths. We can grow that equipment in our, you know, the backpack of our mind, as it were. We can grow that by starting to help yourself have experiences of, like I said, self-calming your body or controlling your impulses or developing self-awareness or having a feeling of warm-heartedness. Help yourself have those experiences or just notice them when you're having them. And then when that song is playing on the inner iPod, turn on the recorder. So you then make it more and more a part of yourself. Rick, I'm loving this conversation. I've got three quick final questions for you because I do want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. This one... I guess might send us down another rabbit hole. So I want, I want to be careful with asking it, but how, how was Buddha's brain, Jesus' brain, and all these other spiritual teachers, how were their brains different from ours or were they? Such an interesting question. So it goes, first of all, to the question of, are there only natural phenomena inside the frame of the Big Bang universe, or are there also supernatural, even transcendental factors, influences, realities that transcend, that are beyond the Big Bang universe? People go back and forth about all that. I myself think, yeah, I think there are supernatural forces. I think there is a transcendental ground uh, in which the Big Bang universe uh, is unfolding. I'm not trying to persuade people to that view that is in my view. So when we think about uh, all of us, not just great teachers like Jesus or the Buddha or others, including people today, you know, uh, there could well be, in my view, forces, factors and so forth that transcend the natural, physical, deterministic unfolding of our own biology, our own body, our own brain. That said, now I'm gonna stay entirely inside the natural frame of the Big Bang universe. And inside that natural frame, it is interesting to examine the brains of people who seem very, very far along in their practice. And there are two findings, kind of big headlines. One headline is that their brains are like everybody else's brains, mainly. 
right? Because they're making, the brains are regulating the heartbeat, observing the world, having thoughts, having memories, they're functioning. Second, in certain key areas, there are some significant changes that seem to be greater and greater correlated with a person's depth of realization. And those major changes typically are in parts of the brain that have to do with four major things. Number one, regulating attention. People who are really far along are able to rest their attention on what's useful and dwell there. And they're able to disengage their attention from things that are not helpful or not be hijacked by them. One, in terms of the neural circuitry of that. Two, uh, they tend to be really in touch with themselves, tuned into their body. There's deep self-awareness. They're, they're in real time with all the layers of, this, of their own psyche. Very cool. Third, emotional regulation. You just look at them. You know, they're regulated. Things happen. They feel it, but it, it does, they're not possessed by it. it. You know, it's there. It's present. And they don't dump their crap on others. They don't. They're not, they're not uh, driven by greed or hatred or fear. They may feel these things, but they're not driven by them. That's the third major change. And the fourth major change, it, again, neurologically grounded, is a shift of sense of self. The circuitry that's involved in the sense of self becomes lighter, looser, and more spacious, which tends to correlate with the sense that people have of being lighter, looser, and more spacious. So those are four major reliable changes that are the fruits of practice and that are developed and fulfilled. And I talk about this in, in my book, Neurodharma, that are developed and fulfilled as people really, really, really move toward the top of the mountain of awakening by whatever path they take, whether it's a Jewish path or a secular path, a Buddhist path, a Christian path, a Islamic path, a first people path, a native people to Australia path, you know, the paths converge on the summit and people who are far, far along in practice look very much alike. It's interesting stuff. <laughs> ah, yeah. tempting, tempting to keep it going, but uh, might have to bring you back at another, another later date, my <laughs> friend. Uh, but my all time favorite question I ask everyone at the end of all my conversations, this is a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Then ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Well, first, I think it's a fantastic question. And uh, it really calls us to... Um, what we value most. Mm. And uh, it's a good way to think like I'm right now in the middle of my 70th lap around the sun on the third rock out, right? So I'm 69 and a half and how cool is that, right? And still a hundred, man, that's 30 and a half years from now. So it's actually really helpful for people to imagine looking back on their life from the future and however old you are, 25 or 69, to ask yourself, when I look back, what do I want to be really glad that I had done in terms of thought, word, and deed? So uh, my hope, I guess, is that, you know, uh, what we'll see is that I brought a good heart to it and I had a learning curve, very important, learned and kept trying. I guess I think of those three as really stand out, heart, learning, and effort. I want to look back and that's what I want to see. Right, send off message. Yeah, and I would say actually also, I think it's really important and it's easy to um, aim too low. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is I want to look back, I hope I will look back and see a willingness and a perseverance in being, in opening increasingly to the ultimate, whatever that is. And to have a vision of the possibility of a human life that 
for me at least, is more than just getting to the weekend and having a good time and not hurting people. As wonderful as that is, I think we all have the possibility for a fullness of awakening, really. And hey, why not go for it? Why not take that next step? Whatever it feels to you is the next step on your own path of awakening. Beautiful. The perfect place to wrap up this great conversation that I have thoroughly enjoyed. But Dr. Rick Hansen, thank you so much, my friend, for your time, your wisdom, your advice, and your stories as well. I greatly appreciate them, and I know my audience will as well. But thank you so much for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you, Jay, and best wishes to everyone listening.